Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. The United States Surgeon General has characterized the decline of mental health among American youth as, and I'm quoting, urgent public health crisis. What's causing this mental health crisis and what should we do? Joining me in the conversation of the state of mental health among the youth is Nina Moreno, Director of Child and Family Services in the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, happy to be here, Bob. Well, so let me just ask the question, was that an exaggeration? Do we really have a national crisis, mental health crisis among the youth? I don't think it's an exaggeration. Um, in addition to the Surgeon General, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Association for Children's Hospitals have also declared a mental health emergency among um, our youth in this country. So I think uh, folks are trying to raise awareness to something that has been going on for a while and bring attention to it as well as necessary solutions and resources. You know, I find it rather ironic in a way, and of course I know I'm a generational or two away from this current um, uh, teen years and ages, but you know, when I was younger, there was really concern among the youth tended to be primarily um, about binge drinking, drunk driving, uh, pregnancy uh, perhaps, and, and, and death by accident. But it's ironic with all the information um, that the generation has today in terms of the youth, uh, they actually are having, um, uh, they're more educated, less likely to get pregnant, they use drugs or die by accident. So it's a little bit of ironic juxtaposition in terms of the concerns today. Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of things we can celebrate that have uh, been going well for the younger generation. To your point, um, there are lower T pregnancy rates. Um, and uh, in general, we haven't seen a steep increase in things like um, adolescent substance use. Alcohol continues to be the most used substance by adolescents uh, due to access and kind of um, societal kind of norms around alcohol, but we haven't really seen, um, you know, drastic swings in those sorts of things. So some things have kind of um, gotten better or remained kind of consistent. Um, but what I do think is um, we have a generation of folks who are very educated and have a lot of access to information. And so they know what, um, they know how to talk about and name some of the experiences that I think a lot of generations have had. And they also have um, kind of the ability to express that in different ways through different platforms. So in some ways, I think our prevention work and our education campaigns around mental health have been very successful because one of the things you want to have happen is for young people to feel like they can come forward and talk about it. We've also done a lot better around screening um, for various mental health issues, especially depression and anxiety. So when we screen, we um, uncover what was already there and then we can intervene more appropriately and earlier. So in some ways, I don't think that it's, um, it's a bad thing that this is coming to light. I think this just means um, some of our prevention work and education work has actually done what we'd hoped it would do. And so um, when, we, when we look at it, there are two prongs. When did we start noticing is because we got better in terms of education, seeing diagnosis, but when did we start seeing what appears to be um, a drastic increase in some of the mental health concerns among the youth? Is there a particular year or, or decade where it kind of just, uh, you can see it beyond or what started before the pandemic? Sure, I mean, it's hard to kind of pinpoint an exact time period or an exact year. I think we've been talking about this for a while, but I think what happened that really kind of raised the alarm was um, the pandemic. And so I think that is what kind of shown the light on a problem that was there before the pandemic, but has been exacerbated. Um, in addition to um, COVID-19, there has been a lot of social unrest. There's been a lot of um, political division in our country and our young people are experiencing that and they're hearing that and they have a lot of access to information um, and all of us have a lot of access to information. So with that um, can come some real challenges of being able to kind of filter information and not become overwhelmed by information. So uh, it is hard to put an exact time on that, but we do know that um, the pandemic has impacted all of us, uh, adults, uh, young people, young adults, kids. Um, and 
So, you know, that gives us an opportunity to kind of really step back and take a look at what's happening and how we can uh, provide some uh, assistance and solutions to that. Well, you know, what kind of uh, aggravates the, the situation even more is the lack of enough mental health care providers and counselors. Uh, my youngest son is a, is a state uh, certified uh, counseling in, in, in private um, um, practice. But I read where the average, if you wanted to have a counselor, the national mean is like 48 days before you can get help. And so that just makes things even worse if you cannot have access to mental health care providers. Absolutely. And that is um, one of our biggest challenges right now in Virginia is our behavioral health care workforce. And that really spans um, all types of positions from um, child and adolescent psychiatrists to nurse practitioners um, to licensed mental health professionals and then to our um, you know, qualified mental health professional and case management level folks and direct support professionals, really the whole continuum uh, our state is struggling. Um, nationally, folks are struggling too, but prior to COVID, Virginia was already 41 um, out of 51, including the District of Columbia, in terms of our behavioral health workforce. So we know that really contributes to challenges when um, young people are um, experiencing challenges. We are um, struggling to keep up with that and to be able to um, quickly and effectively link children and families to the right service in their communities. And so if we look at it from a national perspective and then focus in terms of Virginia, how does Virginia perhaps um, uh, compare with the rest of the nation? Are we more at risk um, or have more um, of a crisis than other parts of the nation? You know, not necessarily in terms of how our young people are doing. Um, as I mentioned, where we, we are struggling is around the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we tend to fare pretty close to average national in terms of things like depression and anxiety. Um, rates of suicide attempt or completed suicide are um, really pretty consistent with um, national trends. Um, we, you know, we do have a, a, a fair amount of youth in Virginia who would um, kind of meet the criteria for what we call major depressive uh, disorder. And then where we struggle is being able to show that we're able to kind of connect those kids to appropriate services. Um, in terms of substance use, um, again, it's pretty consistent with what we see nationally around um, alcohol use followed by marijuana and then vaping. We know those to be big national trends. So while we've seen uh, a big decrease in, in kind of smoking, um, where we've seen an increases with the vaping and, and those sorts of things. So, um, so there's some goods and there's some maybe not so goods in those numbers, but um, you know, overall as a state, I think we are uh, on track with kind of where we see national trends. Well, let's identify some of what would be the more common kind of uh, issues. And I guess you, you keep mentioning uh, two or three right off the top. And I guess uh, depression is one, anxiety is two, and of course the suicide would be third. Can you characterize a little bit about those three? Yeah, I mean, those, um, well, one, uh, in terms of depression and anxiety, we, um, even in the adult population, those are going to be the two um, kind of concerns or challenges that folks would face. So um, it would make sense that our young people would kind of mirror that as well. Depression and anxiety tend to go um, hand in hand. So we see a lot of what we call co-occurring disorders around that. Um, and where we need to be really mindful around like our adolescent population is how then that um, can manifest into problem substance use. So a lot of, um, uh, well, I wanna say there's, there's special risk factors for young people who have untreated anxiety and depression and how they can try to self-medicate um, or try to manage that through substance use. And so we know a lot of um, adult problem substance use or substance use disorders actually can start in adolescence. And typically there is a co-occurring um, mental health or can be a co-occurring mental health issue around depression or anxiety. Um, we do more with screening with depression and anxiety as well. So that means we are able to identify. So that's why you'll see those numbers um, represented a little bit more. You know, it is, it's, it's incredible when I read that the suicide is the second leading cause of death 
among people ages 15 to 24 in the United States. And suicide is obviously one of the things that we just um, hard to understand and dread so much and had no idea that it was that prevalent, the second cause in terms of the uh, youth. Yeah, and it really speaks to the importance of prevention and mental health education and things like mental health first aid. Um, there, you know, we are lucky in Virginia that we have legislation that allows for um, mental health education in um, high schools. Um, prevention is so important. Um, we can we can do more. We can do better when young people are able to quickly access services and, and when they're in need, things like um, mobile crisis services. Um, it's encouraging that we now have 988, which is the um, national crisis suicide um, prevention um, system and that, that has been launched nationally. There will be opportunities as that continues to be developed for us to think about specifically how we can link young people to appropriate um, connections and services. So, um, you know, we are um, looking at things the way we need to be looking at things, but we still have a long way to go in terms of building out our system of care for young people. You know, one element, um, and then we'll move to trying to look at some of the causes of, of the increase, but self-harm. I don't know that I was aware of self-harm as being as prevalent uh, as it is. 25% of college students um, engage in self-harm. It's 15% of young adolescents. That, I just was not aware of that kind of uh, uh, problem. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of times self-harm is um, miscategorized um, as attempts, like a suicide attempt, and it is not um, often that. A lot of times individuals who are self-injuring or self-harming are doing so as a way to cope um, and using that as a coping strategy. And while that might seem kind of strange to some of us who would never think about doing something like that in an effort to cope, um, it really can be a way to uh, maintain control or to feel some sense of control or to actually be able to release very difficult and overwhelming emotions and feelings. So when we um, you know, encounter an individual who is engaging in self-harm, it's really important that we don't stigmatize that or uh, tell people to stop doing that or that that's the wrong thing to do because in fact that can actually just make it worse, but really understand the context in which self-harm happens um, and that it can be a coping strategy. So you, we have to try to help young people and young adults who are engaging in that behavior find other ways to cope with what can be very painful experiences they've had in their life or very difficult and overwhelming emotions. Um, but it is not uncommon. I think it's um, been around for a long time. I think we are more comfortable with talking about it. I think people are more comfortable with talking about it so that it can um, feel like it's a new thing when in fact it it might not be, but that we're just doing a better job of um, maybe taking some of the stigma away from it and allowing people to be able to talk about these kind of painful experiences and things that have led to them doing that. Well, let's talk about and try to identify a few. It's very complex and there are many different uh, things, but I guess we initially want to go through so why is there such a correlation between the increase of or crisis of mental health among youth and you immediately correlate it with the notion of social media. As a lot of the anxiety and some of the depression is based upon the amount of exposure and participation in social media, is that uh, reasonable to say? Uh, I think it's part of it. I don't know that it tells the full picture, but I can just speak for me personally, um, not as a young person, but as a middle-aged adult that I have to take breaks from social media and kind of manage um, what I'm paying attention to because it can get very overwhelming. And we are in an age that is unlike any that um, generations before have experienced in terms of the rapid fire of information and the amount of content that is coming at us and available. And, you know, in many ways, our brains have not um, been able to keep up with that change in terms of uh, how much information is kind of coming towards us at all times. And so it can get very overwhelming. And I think there are um, really great things about social media. It can be a place for people to connect, especially um, to connect with people that have shared lived experiences and to find 
um, important peer groups and social connections that you might not have access to otherwise. It can be a great place to share um, prevention mes messages and um, how to seek help if you need it. So there are many, many good things about social media. And then there's the other side of that where, you know, we do know that it's much easier for young people to be bullied. Um, in ways that other generations maybe didn't have to experience. Bullying can happen 24 hours a day now instead of just when you were at school, right? Um, and so it, it really can be um, challenging in terms of the amount of um, information that younger people are kind of exposed to and having to navigate. Well, you know, certainly the pandemic as a broad area impacts some of the lifestyle stuff. I mean, um, less exercise, um, perhaps uh, less sleep, uh, poor diet, less human face-to-face -face kind of interactions. And I guess the pandemic itself just kind of is another uh, layer that increased the uh, tensions as it relates to mental health. Yeah, I mean, definitely the pandemic has changed all of our lives in big ways. Um, some of us, um, you know, more than others in terms of loss um, and, um, you know, different ways that it's impacted us. But for our young people, um, really, you know, the isolation that occurred during COVID-19, the lack of control, um, coupled with what was happening on the kind of political landscape and social unrest, just made for really challenging times. Um, there were many great positive things about being able to provide virtual schooling during the pandemic. And we also know that there were challenges for many young people um, in that kind of environment. And uh, especially when you're thinking about things like protective factors, um, some of those could have been the school itself, teachers at school, peers at school. And you know when those things became eliminated, there was a lot of isolation that happened and um, for some, you know, really losing kind of some important connections during the pandemic. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, just all of the media and news and things that are coming at folks all the time and um, really the exposure that I think a lot of us are experiencing to just a bunch of information that feels pretty stressful. You know, we've got information constantly about uh, things related to the weather and, um, you know, things happening in other states that we were not always aware of before. And it just um, really can challenge people's ability to cope and manage. And uh, when you take away some of those, um, those important social connections, uh, especially for young people, because that's a big part of development and childhood development is social connections, then you are kind of setting the stage for potentially some challenges, especially if you don't have a really supportive um, family system and environment around you. Is there a, a, a difference um, as it relates to gender and some of the mental health in terms of girls versus uh, uh, females versus males, uh, minority communities versus um, the white population? Are there any kind of differences or is it pretty much um, across the particular generation of the youth? Uh, you know, we do tend to see more females who um, are outwardly expressing depression um, or um, like suicidal ideation or self-harming behaviors. Uh, but I want to have a word of caution around that because I don't think that that means um, that those that identify as male are necessarily faring better. I think we still are in a society where it is less acceptable for a boy to come forward and say that they are feeling depressed or they are feeling anxious. So where we tend to see um, uh, boys who are struggling would be more in the externalizing behavior. So starting to get into trouble or not engaging in school or problem substance use. Um, and so I, I think we have to also kind of look at how we um, allow boys to be able to express themselves and express their feelings. And we um, have done a lot to, I think, reduce some of the stigma around mental health, but we still have a lot more to do because as long as boys feel like it's not um, okay to talk about it, they will continue to struggle, which is also why when um, uh, we see kind of young adults, young men, um, we tend to see higher rates of um, suicide completion, right? So that's, that, that didn't just happen, right? That, that was something 
um, that, you know, maybe over a period of years, there was struggle and challenge where folks felt like they couldn't reach out for help. In terms of um, other populations, yes, we do see a, um, some disproportionality like around um, youth that identify as um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or maybe non-binary um, because there does tend to be more bullying that happens or less acceptance, um, you know, in their communities or potentially in their family settings. Um, so we, we do see a disproportionate amount of um, depression, anxiety, or um, suicidal attempts. And um, our youth of color um, also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, political and social unrest, and uh, that definitely has contributed to um, challenges. I want to be really um, clear, though, that that doesn't mean that those populations are um, somehow uh, frail or fragile, but that really we um, as a society haven't done a good job of creating those safe spaces. And in fact, a lot of times um, uh, people of color will not be given the same access to treatment or even the same diagnosis as um, maybe their white counterpart. Um, and so we do have a lot of work to do around that as well. Well, we only have um, four minutes or so remaining. So if I'm a parent and I have some concerns, what advice, what resources help us understand as a parent what we should be looking for perhaps, what we should do and where we should go if we need help and concern? Yeah, parents have such a big role to play in this. And the first thing I would just say is be able to talk to your kids um, and to have open conversations. Uh, the way we um, help our young people is for them to be socially connected. And that happens through family, that happens through friends, that happens through larger community connections. And when kids have um, adults that they can turn to, then if something is happening, then it's going to be um, most likely noticed sooner and um, treatment can happen sooner or in an in intervention, whatever that might be, can happen sooner. So um, I, I think sometimes parents can be um, not sure how to have those conversations, which is understandable, but it's okay to not have all the right words or to say all the right things, but just to be able to check in with your kids, ask them how they're doing, uh, make sure that you have a good sense of what their social media habits are like and how things are going for them at school. And when they tell you something isn't going well, to be able to, even if you don't have the solution or answer, be able to just listen and sit with them through that. Because a lot of times what we need is just somebody to understand what we're going through. And especially adolescents often feel like the adults around them don't understand um, <laughs> what's going on in their world. And so um, we don't have to have all the solutions and answers, but just being um, open to having conversations can be a first place to start. And the other thing I wanted to mention um, that we're working on in Virginia right now, and I think kind of plays into this, is really looking at integrated care. So what I mean by that is where do kids tend to show up and how do we make sure that we're screening and doing more brief intervention and referral to treatment? So we have programs um, now in the state that we're really um, proud of and excited about. One of those is our Virginia Mental Health Access Program. Um, and that's a, a program specifically for pediatricians to get more training in behavioral health because that's where kids tend to go and where families tend to take their kids. Um, and so that's a great model for the pediatricians to be able to consult with psychiatrists so they can do a doc-to-doc -doc consultation for them to get more training and education in mental health and substance use and to be able to do some of that work kind of earlier on um, and that's just one example. We also are looking at school-based mental health as another key area because that's where kids tend to spend a big chunk of their time. So that way we're bringing the services and the screening and the help directly to them. Well, you know, it's interesting, even in the college and, and other levels, we are now in our programming having, quote, mental health days for students where there will be the expectation of no exams, a long weekend or something like that. And so the awareness and certainly recognizing the need for that uh, is uh, become very much to the forefront. And we will keep learning from our young people. I think they're the ones that are telling us what they need. And um, 
and how we can um, connect and do better. And so I think as long as we are willing to listen and, and hear what they have to say, we will continue to make strides in our um, services and our ability to kind of um, do more on early intervention and detection. Well, this generation of youth is certainly our future and this is really an important topic. I'm sorry we're out of time. Nina, thank you so much for joining us um, on the program. And I also want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.